you're going to be sorely disappointed, a little confused. Just keep on turning in your New Testaments all the way almost to the back, and you're going to stumble into 1 John chapter 1. Now, now we're going to start a new series this morning. Uh, We're going to work through this book, and it's going to take us a long time. And I love doing that because this book is rich, and it has um, a depth of wisdom and information and shaping and challenge for us. Uh, It's going to take us a while, so we're going to start today. We'll get as far as we get in the first chapter. Uh, Maybe through the first chapter. We'll, We'll see. But then we're going to take a break next week because next week is Mother's Day. And I need to hear some baritone and bass voices acknowledging that it's Mother's Day because if I don't hear bass and baritone voices, some of you boys are in trouble next week. So T minus six days and counting to Mother's Day. You with me? Okay. So that's your, it's like set your clocks ahead or fall back. That is your public service announcement, fellas, Mother's Day. And we'll share communion together, and it's just going to be a good morning. And then the following week is going to be uh, Graduate Sunday. Pastor Brian is going to be uh, in pulpit, and we're excited. Is who just, we just, you, you have a terminal degree, so you can say woohoo. No one else can woohoo, but the PhD in the room can woohoo because it is finished, right? Like that, there we go, Okay. So, but, but, but we're going to be celebrating uh, our graduates, and, and we have a ton this year. We're so excited about that. So we're going to pause from this series and spend a moment focusing on that. It's a good time to get... And by the way, Graduate Sunday doesn't mean I don't have a graduate, I'm, I'm skipping. Don't, don't do that, right? There is stuff here for all of us as a family, and we need this moment together as a family of faith. You would not skip Graduate Sunday any more than you would skip Mother's Day because you're, 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 you're a guy, right? So we're going to do that. We're going to be here and celebrate that moment together as a family. It's going to be beautiful. And then the following week, back in 1 John, and we're going to be in 1 John for the duration. And I'm excited about that. This hymn. We didn't talk about this, but, but I, I love this, this chorus. And it's a familiar, particularly to older folks like, like me and maybe some of you, it's a familiar tune. And we go up tempo and, you know, we get going on the, on the ride symbol and we just kind of enjoy the moment. We don't pause and think about what's being said here. So let's just do that, right? Um, so the, the idea behind the entire song is Jesus is alive. And Jesus being alive ought to make some sort of difference in our lives, right? It's not just an idea. It's not just a, a myth. It's not just something that might make us feel good. It, Jesus being alive ought to matter, Right? Okay, so here's how it matters. According to the hymn writer, this is pretty cool. Uh, Because he lives, because he lives, because he lives I know, because he lives life, and because he lives, right? here's, Here's what we're saying. I can face tomorrow. Fear is gone. Something about the future and life worth living. There's some real hard truth here. Because, I don't know about you, tomorrow scares me to death. Yeah? It does. I mean, we come into Mother's Day and, and Graduate Sunday on back-to-back weeks. Babies grow up and leave, right? Tomorrow is very uncertain for them. And babies growing up and leaving means some of us are getting older. Right? No, we're not getting older. Some of us are. You might not be. I am. And the future, tomorrow, this idea of tomorrow, is, is, it's going to be scary. Right? Right? I mean, tomorrow, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's, it's uncertain. And, and because of that, I've got fear, that second line. I'm fearful about what might happen. I'm fearful about tomorrow. Don't even get me started on the future in abstract, that down the road, one day. And, and sometimes, because of the fear, because of the uncertainty, because of the pressure, because of the stress... Sometimes that fourth line, life might not seem worth it, or or life might not seem worthwhile, or maybe 21st century American kind of way of thinking about it, life isn't fun, not what we signed up for or thought it would be. So tomorrow's uncertain, it's full of fear, the future seems like this scary wild west place we're heading to. Life sometimes just isn't what we thought it was going to be. I just wonder, I would, we need to do the, the history. Is this guy having a midlife crisis as he writes the, the hymn, right? Where's he at? 
that I can face tomorrow. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be uncertain about the future. Life is actually worth it, even if it's not how I imagined it, simply because Jesus is alive, right? So that transforms and that changes what we do in, in and look, we have got, we've got folks out there that are worried about the economy. You're worried about your jobs. I've got enough new hips and new knees in the crowd this morning to build a whole new person. I'm just saying. We've been through it, guys. The kids are growing up. They're, they're, there's all kinds of stress with that. Got grandkids growing up right here on the front row. Like, oh my goodness, what? Right? Jesus being alive makes a difference. John, the, the, the disciple of Jesus, the one who was called beloved, the one who wrote that fourth and most distinct gospel, this John who seemed, as he wrote the gospel, to be above all else really concerned that future generations understood with great certainty and clarity who Jesus was and the difference Jesus makes in our normal, average, everyday lives. This John, towards the end of his life, puts pen to paper and writes a short letter. He writes a few short letters, we believe, and there's some scholastic debate on uh, the authorship of Second and Third John, but this one doesn't seem to be in dispute. It, universally, by the earliest churches, universally accepted as canonical and apostolic. That means it's the Bible and someone who knew Jesus wrote it. And even though it's anonymous, um, we even have second century voices, people who knew the Apostle John saying, oh yeah, John wrote that letter. So it's in our Bibles and it's for us. And this same John is writing this letter to a group of people that he loves, a community of faith, probably in the city of Ephesus. We think it's Ephesus. Who's going through some hard times. We're going through some difficulty. Here's what we think is happening. And we'll see these clues as we get into the second chapter in a few weeks. Uh, it seems that there was a group in the church who took issue with a few points of doctrine. Um, as people were teaching and sharing the message about Jesus, some Christians got in their mind, some brothers and sisters in the church got in their mind a novel way of thinking about Jesus that was different than what John and the apostles, the people who knew Jesus, taught about Jesus. And based on that new thinking about Jesus, they set out to maybe change the way they thought about their ethics and their morality. In other words, their lifestyle wasn't looking terribly Christian. And what they were saying about Jesus didn't seem to be terribly historical. And that created division in the church to the point to where those groups kind of, kind of rebelled and they went down the road and they set up their own church who was teaching this new gospel, not the gospel, and encouraging people to live in a way and behave in a way that wasn't very Christ-like. These were people that were, were loved in the church. They were families that were poured into. They were little babies who were discipled. They were people who, who might have even been in, in families of folks who stayed behind in the church that was grounded in apostolic, historical, confessional orthodoxy. And even within this little small town, this little, little place, this little corner of the world, that tension and that division caused real heartache. So all of these things about tomorrow and fear and the future... All the things we talk about, problems within our families and our community, all of that was very real and very pressing to the church that John's writing to. And he's simply writing, and Eric, we can move ahead into the sermon slides. All, right? all of these things are pressing upon them, and John now, this older father figure in the church, this elder figure in the church, writes this letter. Just waking you all up. writes this letter, and he writes this, John, 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him 
and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from, from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is is not not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Let's pray and get to work. Father God, we thank you for these words that are ancient and sacred and true. And oh Lord, this entire book just kind of echoes through the generations that have come before and, and they land here. And I pray they do. I pray they land here because there's so much here about who you are and who we're called to be because of you and who we are in you and and the difference you make in individual lives and the lives of a community of believers. The difference that you can make in spite of division and disunity, the difference you can make in spite of distrust and hostility, the difference you can make because of sin and rebellion. This little book is all about you, Lord, and how good you are to us and how good you are to save us how much you love us and how much the truth of your resurrection ought to resonate and shape our whole lives. So don't let us miss it. Don't let me abuse the text or do injury to the people who are gathered here. But rather, oh Lord, honor the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit move in the hearts of those that believe. Conform us to the image of your Son. Oh Lord, would your Spirit move in the hearts of those that don't believe so that those might be transformed. They may love you and know you and worship you and honor you and follow you and strive to be your disciples. It's why the book is in our hands. It's why we've opened it. It's why we're reading it. It's why we're here. Oh Lord, will you do this? We pray in Christ's name. And amen. And we don't have a ton of details. We, we don't have the other side of the, the argument. But we can reasonably piece together the problem that existed in this little church. We can reasonably piece together the counter-argument by those Christians who went rogue and went sideways based on the themes and the language that John uses. And John writes beautifully. Uh, The language here is rich with poetry. It's it's rich with imagery. And it's rich in in a a duality. He loves to say one thing and then discuss discuss its opposite, right? Uh, he talks, for example, of God being light, and in him there is no darkness. That, that God is the truth, and because he's the truth, he cannot lie. He talks about people who have experienced the word, and who want to then share the word. He talks about people who receive the word, and people who reject the word. He talks about having fellowship with God, and you can't have fellowship with God without having fellowship with each other. He talks about a self-righteousness that exists in the hearts of so many people. And he sets that in juxtaposition to an honest sinfulness that is repentant. A sin that is dealt with. These themes are going to dominate. You have to look for them. And I want us to maybe crack a grin when we see them in the text. But, But look, the big idea of the entire book is this. He's encouraging this group of discouraged believers to stay on point with the gospel. Uh, To know with certainty who Jesus is and what he's done. He's encouraging them that their morality, their their pattern of living ought to be shaped by Jesus and conform to Jesus' example. He's encouraging them that they are on the right way. And that because they're on the right way, they're on the right way together. Together. So there are three claims we see in the text. Three claims that seem to be what those in opposition to the gospel, 
in this city, probably Ephesus, are saying. And here we go. In verse 6, they're going to say that they have fellowship with God too. In verse 8, they're going to say that they are without sin. And in verse 10, they are going to say, in fact, they have not committed sin at all. Three big claims that John's dealing with right here. That they have fellowship with him. They are without sin. They have not sinned at all. Verses 6, 8, and 10. And, and before we dive into that, you've got to ask the question, well, okay, so there's this opposition group. And there's an existing church they broke away from. And there's an argument, a division. So who's John to stand as arbiter? Who is the author, the writer of this little short letter to step up and go, hey, I'm going to be the judge for you, right? Uh, my understanding is there was a horse race yesterday, right? Okay, so next week we're talking about gambling and not even funny. Nobody laughs. I had one laugh. Everybody else is like nervous chuckle, right? Okay, so there was a horse race yesterday and a horse won. And then a horse didn't win because got disqualified, got overturned by a jury of three officials. And I, I don't follow horse racing at all. I have no idea. My understanding is there's people very upset about it because apparently it was a ticky-tack thing to do. Am I right? Okay, so these three guys who are... And who are they to judge? Well, they are the judges, right? They're experts in the field, and they're the guys we're going to do. Baseball happening right now. ASU playing... Got rained out last night. They kid you not, Albany State has to play the bottom of the ninth inning, and they're up by two or three runs, right? So they're going to play that. If they win, on to the championship game in their conference, go Rams, right? But what, what happens in baseball every time? They're, they're throwing into the strike zone. Have you ever seen a strike zone? Neither have I. It's totally imaginary. It's this imaginary box. It's different for every batter that steps up there. So who's going to say strike versus ball? Who's going to call that? An umpire. And who is an umpire to make that call? Well, if you ask the manager if he disagrees, the umpire is no one at all, right? He's simply the object of ridicule and scorn because you can't kick the dirt, right? You might as well yell at somebody. But no, he's an expert. He's trained. He's qualified. He's certified. He's there. He's the guy making the call. Who is John to write a letter saying, let me tell you, you guys are having an argument. You guys are having a disagreement. There's a there's drama in the youth department. There's never drama in our youth department. But if there was drama in our youth department, who's going to step... You guys are just looking at me funny. Who is going to step in to arbitrate that? Who is this John to, to put himself in this position? Well, look at verse 1. Let's just walk through it. I don't want you to miss it. John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. All right? So, so John says, hey, there's this gospel message that you guys need to stay true to. Those folks down the road haven't stayed true to it. But I'm telling you, you're on the right path. And I can tell you that because we heard it. We have seen it with our eyes. We've looked upon it and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What's he talking about? We saw Jesus. He's saying, we, I'm writing on behalf of my, my brother apostles. My, my brother and sister followers of Jesus, who were, we were in the room where it happened. We saw Jesus, we heard Jesus, we hung out with Jesus, we ate with Jesus, we touched him with our hands. Now, I don't know who those guys are that broke away from you, or what authority they're claiming to do that, but the author is claiming, without a doubt, I knew Jesus. I was there, I witnessed it, and not alone, I witnessed it with brother apostles, with brother and sister disciples, and it's on their authority, that authority, the historical authority, that we're writing these words. Verse 2, the life was made manifest. We've seen it, and we testify to it, we proclaim it, the eternal life, which was with the Father, made manifest to us. If you need a first century claim that Jesus was divine, here's one from Scripture. So that, verse 3, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. He's saying, look guys, we, we, we saw Jesus. We heard Jesus. And we're only passing down to you that which we were witness to. That's the authority. That's the authority. It is the witness of the apostles that ought to dictate what we believe as a church and how we practice the Christian faith and how we live the Christian life. 
But John is long dead, and so is Peter, Paul, and Mary. So what are we to do? Where do we go in the 21st century in America to find a witness, an apostolic witness, a historic witness to who Jesus is? Where do we go? This is why we make the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures, the cornerstone of who we are and what we believe as a local church. In scripture, we have the recorded witness of the apostles. There's no tradition following that or flowing out of that that competes with that. It is the word of God alone. Why? Because we have in that book, bound in leather, in your hands this morning, words and witness from 2,000 years ago of who Jesus was and what the earliest Christians said, taught, and believed about him. And we have it preserved unchanging. Unchanging and unwielding. That's not the word, unyielding. That's what I was trying to say. And so we need to be to our commitment to it. We stand upon it because here we have a testimony that's clear. John says, I knew Jesus and I'm writing to you. We have that for us today. And he's not writing it. I love this. Don't miss this. He's not writing it to win an argument. There's too much of American evangelicalism that exists merely to win arguments. Christian Twitter is a joke. It is. A liberal, progressive author and teacher died yesterday. Complications to the flu, 37 years old. Disagree with almost everything that person taught about who Jesus was. I do. But even in the midst of of human loss and tragedy, a lot of my brothers and sisters took to Twitter and Facebook and Insta-whatever To say ugly things about a person that's died. It's ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous and it's it's unchristian. It's unchristian because it's far from the heart of of God. It's far from the example of Christ. There's no love. There's no compassion. There's no mercy. There's no hope for sharing the gospel on the backside of ugliness publicly put out there with our thumbs. And too much, too often, we want to win debates... We want to win arguments. We want to be right for the sake of being right. And yeah, John is trying to win an argument in this letter. He is. He's saying this is right. This is orthodox. That's wrong. It's heresy. It ought to be what we believe about who Jesus was. The gospel truth ought to be defended. And yet, it's not for the sake of destroying his enemies publicly. It's not. It's not why he's writing. What's his heart? What's his motivation? And calling out, look at it, it's right here in verse 4. And we are writing these things, why? So that our joy may be complete. Now your translation might say your joy. There's actually some manuscript question about what the word is. It's your or it's our, but the sense there is not. John's saying, I want to be happy, it's why I'm writing. He says, no, I want our joy. You guys that I'm writing to. Your joy needs to be complete in Christ Jesus. And those of us who are back here writing out of the apostolic tradition, our joy needs to be complete in Christ Jesus. He's not trying to destroy his enemies. He's not trying to fireball them into oblivion. He's not trying to wipe them out like you're playing Fortnite, guys. He is trying to say, look, this is the truth. This is who Jesus is. And when we know the truth of who Jesus is, and it makes a difference in our hearts, and it makes a difference in our lives, we will be a joyful people. Okay, so let's do it. You ready, church? Let's get crazy. Some, just, shh, just you, shh. Look around. Like, like, look around and look at some faces. Like, out corner of your eye. All right, do they look joyful? Like, no, shh, shh, shh. look, look, look. No, no. Look, at that guy. look at that guy right, look, right, right beside you, right next to you. Look, look, look. To your left, look at him. Look at him. Is that a joyful face? Like, I think he's got indigestion. I think that bean burrito last night at San Joe's was a bad idea. I think it's not said. Mm. Shh, look at look, look at her. Look at her. Look at her down there. Look at her down there. Man, she teaches. She teaches kids Sunday school like every other every other week. Man, look at that face. Is she happy. Man, are we are we a joyful people? 
Dude, we are not a joyful people. Like, we're not. We're not. In fact, I even thought about, as I'm thinking about how I even, in this moment, preach God's word. And there's a lot of times when I'm coming at you guys and I seem angry. Don't tweet at me, right? Don't at me, right? Don't, don't do that. But just thinking about lately, it's like, hey, there's been a lot of moments. And, and there are texts that are heavy, that lay heavy upon us. But oh my goodness, we don't, we don't preach the truth, even the heavy and the hard truth, so that we can like pound our opponents into powder. No, the word of God breaks us. It does. It convicts us of sin. It does. It calls us to repentance, which is tearful and hard and painful. But on the backside of repentance, there ought to be joy. If we are not joyful people as we follow Jesus, I think the New Testament would tell us we're following Jesus wrong. And nobody's smiling. Look, I'm writing this to you not because those guys need to get obliterated. I'm writing to you so that our joy together might be complete in Christ Jesus. We're going to get Jesus right and it's going to make you joyful people. We're going to start living in a Godward way, and it's going to make us a joyful people. We're going to stop doing sinful, stupid things and start living the way Jesus told us to live. And it's going to make us a joyful people. We're going to be committed to Christ and grow as disciples. We're going to read a book, and we're going to put down sin, and we're going to follow Jesus, and it's going to make us joyful people. Teenagers, we are going to fight against all of the flesh and temptation and nonsense in our culture We're going to stand apart and be distinct and be different. We're going to be the weirdos in the group. We have to be because everybody else is following the world. And we're going to follow Christ. And even in that isolated position, it will cause in us and create in us joy. And I'm grateful. You guys are the only ones who laugh at my jokes. I get it. Now, they might be laughing at me, not with me, but that's okay. Senior adults... Senior saints, people who got more gray hair than me. People who look at me at 40-something-something something and still call me a kid. All right, there it is. Um, the kids will get that joke, so it's like cut it out. All right, no, you guys are good. Love you guys. Here we go, guys. Listen, 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 listen. Guys. Here's, here's, here's the perception. It was true when you were a kid. Okay. They look at us with the gray hair. I'm over here now. They look at us without much hair over here. I'm, I'm one of y'all. They look at us who have said we've been following Jesus for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. They look at us. Do they see a joyful people? Or are we the stereotypical, sitting out there somewhere, Baptist, sour-faced old folks, following Jesus as long as we've been following Jesus, should at this point in our journeys cause us joy? Oh my goodness, like you turn on Netflix and we're sparking joy over cleaning out our closets. And we say that the author of life has given us life. And we're a bunch of Sour Patch kids. If we don't get anything else from what we do in First John over the next couple of months. Oh Lord, would he break us and convict us and cause us to be a people who know him. And by knowing him, we might have joy that's complete. And quickly now, and I think we can get through this. They claimed, these other Christians, these rogue believers, that they have fellowship with Jesus. And here's what he says in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, so this is what they were doing. They said, we have fellowship with Jesus, but we don't look like Jesus. We have fellowship with Jesus, but we don't act like Jesus. We have fellowship with Jesus, but we're comfortable with our sin. We have fellowship with Jesus, but it's anything but the gospel that we're teaching and living for. We walk in darkness. Church, we examine our hearts. 
It is possible to say we follow Christ and not. Very possible to do that. It is. For four or five hundred years in the English speaking church, we've talked about practical atheism. Stephen Chernock coined the phrase centuries ago, generations ago. The idea that we can claim to follow Jesus as much as we want to and that just be a function of culture and be nothing that's transformed our head or our hearts or the way that we behave. We can claim the title Christian and have nothing to do with actually following Christ. If I put on a Georgia Bulldogs jersey, does that mean I'm starting at linebacker this fall? If I claim all day long to be a neurosurgeon, are you going to let me crack open your skull with a spoon and do some surgery? I can say with my mouth who I am or what I do or what my credentials are, but the truth of the matter is, if there is not real change, if I'm not the genuine article, if I am not a committed, converted follower of Jesus, it is possible to say I follow Jesus, but I walk in darkness. And here's the reality. If we're doing that, he says in verse 6, we lie and we do not practice the truth. We can claim allegiance to the truth and not practice it. We're in darkness. We can claim to belong to the truth but not practice it. We're in darkness. We can claim things about Jesus all day long. But not practice the truth. And John says, my little one, my loved one, we're we're not his. That's what they're claiming. But here's what's true in verse 7. He says, but if we walk in the light, and what does that mean? Walk in the light? I want to play like a DC Talk song from the 90s, right? I want to be in the light as he is in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the right. Some of you guys from my generation are having a flashback right now. It's a, it's a fun thing. I want to be in the light. Man, that sounds poetic. I don't know about you, but I kind of skipped that lecture English 101. I didn't like poetry. What does it mean to be in the light? We turned the lights off on you like three times already in this service. What's going on? What is that? What? Here, here it is. Here's what that means. Here's, here it is applied. If we walk in the light, what does that mean? As he is in the light. In other words, if we're acting like and looking like and behaving like and striving after being like Jesus, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. Oh my goodness, it is the ubiquitous uh, 17-year-old and 24-year-old kind of Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian question. How do I know that I'm saved? Okay. Do you want to be like Jesus? Are Are you more like Jesus now than you were when you made that claim? Do you want to be more like Jesus a month from now than you are right now? And are you actually doing squat to make that happen? We don't go from broken sinner to super saint in a moment. But day by day, little by little, Jesus conforms our hearts and our minds and our deeds and our desires to his And when we see that progression happening in our own lives, that's not going to save us. He did that work on the cross, but it's going to let us know that the work on the cross has been applied to us. And wherever we are in that journey, weak or strong, young or old, we can rest and know, yes, I belong to him. He's in the light. I'm trying to be in the light like he's in the light. So I'm in the light and I have fellowship now with the church. Second claim they make. Oh, and I'm going to be done. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, and some of us in our generation and your generation go, man, that's, that's silly. I've never claimed that. I promise you there are folks in this generation that are absolutely making that claim. I mean, shark keen theological minds saying sin is not a big deal. That the gospel might be about something else. That it's not an issue that I'm not Hitler. We always drag Hitler into this, right? So that's the standard. We don't sin. Or if we do, our sin is not as bad as... We always had that kid in school. We always had that family in the neighborhood, right? 
Like, I know I'm a sinner, but there's the town drunk. I'm going to point to him as the example of sin. If I'm morally better than him, then I must be okay. That's sin. If we claim to have not, I'm sorry, if we say we have no sin, what do we do? In verse 8, we deceive ourselves. You're not fooling anyone. You are not perfect and fall short of God's standards. I know this because I've had a cup of coffee with you. I know this because I've, I've, I've been in your life for more than two minutes. And hey, here's the deal. I've sinned and you know that because you've been around me for more than seven seconds. Like we get it. The world is busted. People are broken. And that's universal. Meet any person you want to hold up as the picture of morality. And I promise you, get in their life and you're going to see the cracks. Because they're there for all of us. If we say we have no sin, all we're doing is kidding and fooling ourselves. And if we deceive ourselves in this way by saying we have no sin, verse 8, the truth is not in us. We are only fooling ourselves. Guys, we have not been transformed. Here's, here's the Baptist version of that. Man, when I was uh, 16, 17, 18 years old, I was going down a bad path. So I walked down an aisle, I prayed a prayer, and Jesus saved me. And everything's been great ever since. Yeah, so here's the way that really works. Jesus saved me, and I still wrestle with the flesh, and I fall on my face. Often. The grace in my life that was given to me because of what Jesus did on the cross, man, I live there. I camp out on that grace. Because I am broken. Here's verse 9. Here's the good news. If we confess our sins, we don't lie to ourselves, say we've got it worked out, we've got it figured out. If we confess our sins, what is his response? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I love that John pulls apart unrighteousness and sin. And I think in his mind there are two different things. In this moment, I think we hear two different things. I think we look at the total human condition and realize, man, I've got guilt that needs forgiveness. I've done things that fall short of God's standards. I've done things that have been an offense to God. I fall short and that guilt needs forgiveness. He's faithful if we confess our sins to forgive them and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our guilt needs forgiveness and, guys, our uncleanness needs purification. That, that, that sin that's in, that sin nature, that desire, that flesh to do the wrong thing, man, it's there. And it, it, it's looking for opportunities to falter and to fall, to lead us, not just into temptation, but into sin. That uncleanness needs to be purified, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from it. If we say in verse 10 that we have not sinned, I believe this is an echo of what he's just said. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Sin, here specifically the sin of self-righteousness, is an offense to God. I sin, and I say it's not a big deal. I sin... And I pretend like it's not there. I sin and I cover it up. I sin and deny that it's a moral problem. I sin and say, well, I'm not Hitler or the town drunk, so I'm okay. We call, it's an attack upon the goodness of God. And it proves that we're far from him. If you're living a life of comparative morality and say, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not that one. John says that proves truth is not in us. So what do we do? How do we deal with this text? What do we do with this text? Number one, we examine our heart. Because we're either full of truth or full of lies. The individual has to look into their own heart and decide what is there. Who are we longing after? What are we striving after? Secondly, we have to examine our lives. We actually have to look at the stuff that we're doing. And if we're doing stuff that Jesus wouldn't do, if we're doing stuff that doesn't honor him, if we're doing stuff that's far from him, guys, it's a light or darkness issue and you can't be in both. It's light or darkness, not a gentle shade. We have to decide. 
We have to experience the word. I love that he begins the chapter with that. Look, we've experienced Jesus. We knew Jesus. We hung out with Jesus. We learned from Jesus. Jesus was just all in our lives and we were all in his. It was an enmeshed relationship. And it's on the basis of that enmeshed relationship that everything got changed and transformed. We have to experience the word. We have to know Jesus. This is huge for us. We know a lot about Jesus. We don't know Jesus. This is a problem. That, that, that our spirituality can be all tangled up in emotion and not based on any truth that's true. But our doctrinal correctness and fidelity, our good theology, our good Baptist polity, absolutely can be devoid of, of any meaningful relationship, knowledge, or experience of him. We have to experience the word. And experiencing the word means we're in fellowship with him. And yes, in fellowship with each other. This is not a, when he says in fellowship with each other, he's not talking about this kind of mystical, spiritual, all Christians together. No, he's talking to a local church about a local church. Writing from a local church. We experience the church here. Here and now, together with one another. We experience the word, the fellowship of the Father, the fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We experience him after examining our hearts and our lives. We have to complete our joy. This is the big one and we're done, I promise. We complete our joy, how? By sharing that word with others. Does that mean talking about Jesus? Absolutely. Does does that mean serving because of Jesus? Oh yeah. Does that mean showing kindness to a neighbor in Jesus' name? You better believe it. Does that mean volunteering down at the Boys and Girls Club to get involved in kids' lives? You know it. Does that mean praying for our community because our community needs prayer? Boy, I hope that you do. Does that mean that we're volunteering in the lives of the next generation? Yeah, it's absolutely biblical. We've got to do that. Does that mean we're involved in the lives of families with little kids in our church? Yeah, it is. We help brothers out when they need a hand. I hope so. We complete the joy by sharing all the things he's invested and done for us with one another. In other words, what John is going to do, he's going to take this good theology and he's going to put it on wheels and send it down the road. And now we'll be a people not just of faith, but faith in action. That's where we're going. Can't wait to get on this journey with